screaming down the track or roaring through the corners. There is no margin for error. For professional motorcycle racers, there's only one question, how to go faster. We're gonna need to go three seconds quicker. It takes courage, skill, and instinct. That's not gonna be on the straightaways? I wish, but no. <laughs> <laughs> and the answers aren't always found on the racetrack. The quest for speed involves some amazing science, some remarkable engineering, and most of all, some fascinating secrets in the never-ending search for speed on two wheels. Motorcycles are all about passion and speed. More than 23 million Americans ride, most ride street bikes or cruisers, a style made famous by companies like Harley Davidson. But for people seeking the maximum in thrills and performance, the answer is a very different type of motorcycle, a motorcycle they call a sport bike. Today's sport bike motorcycle, it just continues to get better. The performance and the technology that are put in these motorcycles is, is just phenomenal and outstanding. This is an exciting time. When you can buy an incredible performance for $10,000 right off the showroom floor, and really, literally, you can take a, a modern sport bike and go racing with it. The American Motorcycle Association Racing Series is where sport bikes and the best of the best go racing. They run in two different engine size classes called Superbike and Super Sport. The most powerful are called Superbikes, and Matt Maladden, a five-time champion, is the man to beat. You've always got the target on your back whenever you're on the racetrack, because you're the, you're the guy that people are trying to beat, and over the five or six, last five or six years, we've been you know, the fastest guys out there and won all the championships. So, um, but to me, that's what makes it exciting. I enjoy the pressure side of it. I enjoy the fact that I've got to be the guy that has to keep getting up front and, 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 and in front of everybody else. So. The other major class competition is Super Sport, and two brothers from Kentucky, Tommy and Roger Hayden, dominate the series. Super sport bikes have smaller engines, but smaller is a relative term. Daytona is probably our fastest track, and we're reaching speeds right at probably 190, you know, high 180s for sure. For me, it's just the thrill getting out there and competing every day. You know, the guy beside you wants to beat you just as bad as you. More than half a million fans attend the races. Millions more watch on TV, but what none of them gets to see is what goes on behind the scenes in a constant quest to make the bikes go even faster. We're just breaking in brake pads, so. <clears throat> but I was just wondering if Tommy noticed anything there. He commented on it at all. It's not just what a rider can feel. During test sessions, dozens of tiny computer sensors record everything that's happening. Here we have a comparison of laps. We're seeing that Tommy's able to open up the throttle a little bit more than Roger is, and we're trying to sort out exactly why, why that is. At this level of racing, all riders have incredible courage and skill, but the very best have something else, a unique ability to push their bikes right to the edge. The truly gifted riders have a sense of speed. The top three guys, certainly in the nation, have an ability to, to see a corner coming at them at a speed that would overwhelm uh, me and you. From a racer's point of view, especially a top racer, it's very, very hard to, to put into words exactly what goes on on the racetrack because things happen. Things just happen, man. You just keep going, you know. Yeah, you concentrate on going fast and that's it. The AMA Racing Series is spread out over seven months, 10 different weekends at tracks all across the country where they race on both Saturday and Sunday. Me and Tom had a terrific year last year. We won about 80% of the races in our class, so we definitely want to back it up, and that's the goal. 
that's the goal for sure to win, you know, win the championship again this year and make it, you know, two in a row. Following the racers and their teams is the ultimate lesson in how a motorcycle really works, and some of the answers are not what you might think. How much the tires weigh in general? Just average, just pick a number. Rear probably weighs are they 13, 14 pounds. Front probably weighs 10. Every year we're going faster, the tires are getting better, and the bikes are getting faster, so uh, it won't be long, we'll be going 200, I'm sure. It takes incredible skill to ride at those speeds. The Hayden brothers, Tommy, Roger Lee, they came up riding dirt bikes and they have transferred all the things they learned on a dirt bike to a street bike, to a road racing motorcycle. Here we are in the dirt because a dirt bike is a great way to learn how motorcycles really work. One thing we can examine with my little dirt bike here is gyroscopic effect. When this thing is stopped, it is unstable, inherently unstable. At rest, it wants to tip over. At a little speed, everything changes. In a straight line, the faster a motorcycle goes, the more stable it becomes. That's because as a motorcycle begins to move, the wheels act just like one of those toy tops you had as a kid. The faster you spin them, the more stable they are. It's called the gyroscopic effect. A gyroscopic effect is parts of the motorcycle spinning to keep it upright. And the faster those parts spin, uh, the more stable that motorcycle be becomes. Here is a vivid demonstration of gyroscopic effect. A test rider for Dunlop tires on a big, heavy touring bike. Taking his hands off the handlebars, the bike keeps going straight. Then he intentionally hits the right hand grip to make the bike wobble. But because it's moving and the tires are spinning, the motorcycle regains perfect stability all by itself. He says, he says the average is 12 pounds. The next motorcycle surprise is waiting just around the corner. If you're just riding along and you're coming into a right hand turn, you don't really realize it, but initially you turn the handlebars the other way, the opposite way of the turn, to, to, for the bike to lean into the turn. It's counterintuitive. You're taking the handlebars, you're turning them slightly to the left to have the bike fall in and turn to the right. The technique is called counter steering, but the initial movement of the front wheel in the opposite direction of the turn is too small and too fast to see in real time. Before a turn, the inertia of a moving motorcycle is keeping it upright with the wheels moving in a straight line. When a rider pushes on the handlebars moving the front wheel to the left, inertia tries to compensate and leans the bike to the right. Racing a sport bike, the most fun part, or even riding a sport bike on the road, I do a lot of riding on the road with friends and that sort of stuff, and, and going through the turns is what is the, is the biggest rush out of anything. For professional racers, part of that rush comes from their ability to ignore what their brain's trying to tell them. The average person feels uncomfortable or even perceives danger leaning over more than 20 degrees. Racers can lean their bikes as far as 60 degrees, and they do it at speeds that are unbelievable. Your average rider on them will go through the corner, you know, at 45, 50 miles an hour, and, you know, that's an exhilarating rush, and they think that's really done something. Whereas Tommy and Roger on one of our race bikes, they might go through it 80 or 100 miles an hour, and that is really a rush to watch and you'll see them with their knee dragging the ground, just skimming the ground ever so lightly. And basically that's kind of a feeler gauge for them to see how far they can lean it over. At those speeds, counter steering begins the turn, but then racers need to add other inputs. They shift their weight to the inside of the corner lowering the bike's center of gravity. They push down on the inside foot peg 
using it as a lever to rotate the bike around its horizontal axis, making it lean even more. And the whole time, their focus is on what's called the line, the quickest way through any corner. We're now standing on a racetrack in a typical left-hand corner to illustrate the line. It consists of three things. The entrance point, the apex point, which is the closest you come to the inside edge of the racetrack, and the exit point. This is one of the most surprising aspects of road racing, the apex spot. Tommy and Roger Lee Hayden won't miss this exact perfect apex spot by more than six inches. That's their margin of error. That's how exact they are, and that's phenomenal. Six inches, that's their margin of error. Any one of us could hit this spot now and then at slow speeds. They do it lap after lap at racing speeds. So just how do they do it? Well, for both man and machine, the answers hold even more surprises. You might think motorcycle racers spent every possible minute practicing on the track. Truth is, top riders like Tommy Hayden spend a lot more time riding bicycles than motorcycles. These guys train with high heart rates. They ride bicycles, they jog, they swim. Anything to keep that heart rate up and elevated over a long period of time. They need to learn to be able to think and make decisions while they're exhausted. Motorcycle racing is a really demanding sport, and for me, you know, I have a, a personal trainer, and we do a lot of road cycling and a little and some gym work. Matt Maladin is the Lance Armstrong of AMA Racing. He's going after an unprecedented sixth championship title in the Superbike Series. Like Armstrong, his edge is experience and maximum physical conditioning. There's kids out on the racetrack that can ride every bit as good as me. But putting it together for 28 laps is a whole different story, especially when it's 100 degrees and the humidity's high and you get fatigued. Um, putting it together, putting it together for 45 minutes on the racetrack is a whole different story. They are true athletes. They train every day. Uh, they train their bodies. They train their minds. Like all professional athletes, racers possess an almost superhuman ability to concentrate. They have to. Reaction time on the racetrack is in, in terms of milliseconds. The sensation of speed is so overwhelming that if you aren't exactly in the moment, concentrating on that one thing, you'll be off the racetrack. Most of my thinking goes into planning a strategy as I'm, as I'm in the race, not thinking, okay, I'm coming down this straight, I've got to break, I've got to turn, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. It's, if you're thinking about that, it, it's all gone too, it's too late. The speed and just the way things happen so quick, you know, it's, uh, it's like nothing you'll ever feel before. So just how fast do things really happen on a track? We've all dropped an egg at home. It's a great way to demonstrate how much these guys do in such a short time. It takes about a half a second for this egg to leave my hand and hit the ground. Half a second, 180 miles an hour, they cover half a football field. In that time, they're braking, downshifting, feeling the front tire tracks and moving their body, dropping their heads and feeling brake pressure. It's incredible. That just happens in an instant, you know what I mean? And, and it's not something you think about like that. Well, I know I don't. I mean, if you try and think through the racetrack, your, your brain is still be on the fifth lap when your bike's on the tenth lap. It's really exciting and just everything's happening so fast. And your mind gets used to it really, you know, and kind of slows, kind of slows everything down. The eyes are another surprise. They can trick your brain into slowing down the sensation of speed. It all depends on where you look. Vision is everything and the, and the gifted, truly gifted riders see corners and sense speed with their vision <laughs> better than you and I do. Doing this sport well, it begins with the eyes. Most people look too close in front of them and boy does it look fast. The road is just spinning by. It's overwhelming. Learn to get those eyes up like the road racers do. Look to your future.
very good equation to remember is distance equals time. Look further down the road, you've got more time to react and deal with the future, whether that's problems or great corners. Going where you look, that's an interesting phenomenon, and it, it, it's amazing. You'll be riding your dirt bike through the desert, and you'll be riding along, and you'll stare at a rock, and certainly the bike will hit the rock. It's an amazing thing. And, um, it's, and what we learn from that is we need to look where we want the bike to go. So you have to look at where you want to go, but what happens in a blind downhill corner where you can't see where the road goes? Roger Hayden explains as he prepares for a race by driving around the two and a half mile track at Road Atlanta. You try to find a point over the hill because you can't see and uh, you know you try to always find a reference point and you know you know find one that doesn't move you know like some people used to use things on the side of the track and then you know they would move or a shadow would move so I always try to find a, a light pole or a hole in the wall that's never gonna move and that way you always know if you aim for that the track you know is not gonna run out on you. What works on the track works on the road. Well, people will go snow skiing and they have to take a lesson. They won't go skiing without taking a lesson. Yet they'll jump on a sport bike without really knowing what they're doing. That's crazy. The answer, learn some new instincts and habits from the experts. Dawn at the California Motor Speedway near Los Angeles. On this day, the track is about to become a classroom. The students, regular people who love motorcycles. Their riding experience ranges from a few months to as much as 30 or 40 years. This is not a race school, but a racetrack is actually the safest place to learn better riding skills because it's a controlled environment. Their teacher, Reg Pridmore, a world famous racer and the first man to ever win the AMA Superbike Championship. The new people, let's see who you are. First time, whoa, we're in trouble today. <laughs> Reg and a group of handpicked instructors split the day between classroom sessions and time on the track. One or two of you didn't sleep too well last night. One or two of you didn't even have breakfast this morning because you got the nervous stomach. Yeah, well, everybody has. They're just not telling you, that's all. So just get out there and relax because there's no pressure. I've been banging it for a long time, 51 years now, and I'm not really old enough to say, I don't want to do this anymore. It's good fun. I like to go fast. I like to go slow. I like to evaluate. I like to do a lot of critiquing. I like to do an awful lot of things that makes motorcycling safer. Instructors pull riders off the track from time to time, explaining what the student is doing wrong, and more importantly, how to do it right. Turn three. Coming down the hill, I passed you twice on the inside, remember? Yeah. I did that for a reason. I wanted to show you what happens. When you go into turn three, and someone passes on the inside, your path is now determined by them, not yeah. you. They're now in control. First and foremost, you are in control of this, which operates that. And if you don't put this and that together today, things go sort of out of whack real quick. To keep things from going out of whack, the day starts slowly with an emphasis on the basics, including changing a lot of bad riding habits that students develop over the years. I think the braking part is, is intimidating because of the, the concept of going over the handlebars. It's one of the most important things to know about a motorcycle, how to use the front brake, because the front brake provides as much as 90% of the braking force. The front brake is what really stops a motorcycle. We're going to have one more session on the track before we do our little break-in exercise. For some of these students, this exercise is the first time they've ever really used the front brake. They were afraid and they were wrong. You wanna make me walk, break don't you? Out,
I'm gonna do a braking exercise to showcase how much braking power is in the front brakes. I'll do a stop with the front brake only, then I'll do rear brake only, and you'll see the bike doesn't stop very well at all. Then I'll combine them, and then last time, I'll overdo the front brake. Okay, here we go. I'm going 50 miles an hour into the braking zone. I'm, I roll off the throttle onto the front brake, and we're stopped. I am at 50, roll off onto the rear brake, my hands off the front brake, and whoo, this thing is not slowing down at all. Third time down now, so it'll be front and rear brake together. I, I can feel the weight transfer. I lock the rear a little bit. That is my stop. Boy, it's not, it's not much better than front brake alone, simply because there's just not much weight on that rear tire. There's not much braking force available back there. Final time down now, I'm gonna just go to the front brake and I'm gonna overdo it. Here I go up and that rear end comes off the ground. How much braking pressure is available back there now? Zero. I abused it, took the rear wheel off the ground. And I overdid the front brake. You can't do that in the car. You can't stand a car up on the front end. On a sport bike, it's all about using that front brake, not abusing it. You wanna look for a secret to the best road racers? It's the feel they have on the front brake lever. That's better. Back at the riding school, the braking exercises are paying off on the track. Good stuff. Good, Jimmy. That's all I'm looking for. There it is. That's the one. Then everybody's back on the track, including Reg, who's riding a specially equipped camera bike. I'm just warming up my slicks. Didn't know whether to come out in the rain or not, but the track's drying out a little bit. Guy's looking good, got his feet up, good position, and good track. This is another lady I saw here this morning, doing quite nicely, she's got her feet up. She's picking her points in the corner, she's looking up track, good stuff. His left arm is very, very straight. Uh, I think this is Chuck, I'm gonna have to beat him with a big baseball bat, or maybe a cricket bat might work, I don't know. But a um, little bit pushy on the bars there, Chuck. Like all regular riders, students at the Primmore School ride motorcycles they bought right off the showroom floor, bikes that just as easily could have ended up on a race team. That's because even the professionals start with a stock bike in a crate straight from the factory, and then they use every trick in the book to push them to the limits. It's a lot different than how they did it when the first sport bikes were built. One of the most exciting things about professional motorcycle racing is that you can always push the limits because there really are no limits. You're never going fast enough. You're always, you're always striving to get faster, that's what we do, you know. Modern day sport bikes are the ultimate ride. They're unbelievably fast and they can carve corners like crazy. It is like strapping yourself onto a rocket. Sport bikes are a relatively late addition to the motorcycle world. The very first motorcycle was actually built in 1885 by Gottlieb Daimler and Wilhelm Maybach, two German inventors whose work would eventually help create Mercedes-Benz. In the United States, motorcycles are synonymous with Harley-Davidson. Founded in 1903, Harleys would become the king of big cruiser style of bikes. As for racing, in the 1920s and 30s, motorcycle companies chased speed records rather than each other. In 1937, a BMW motorcycle reached the then incredible speed of 175 miles an hour. This was very, very fast at this time because you have to imagine um, the tires are very bad for if you look back today or the suspension and they start also with this aerodynamic fairing. They have absolutely no experience like today. You have all these this wind tunnels and things like this and this um, computer uh, design. Well, everything changed after World War II. People in Europe needed cheap transportation. For a while, even old bicycles with tiny engines were considered motorcycles. At that time, uh, the, nobody had the money to buy cars or motorcycles. We are talking about 1946, just uh, after World War II. 
So there were a lot of bicycles, and that was the way to change a bicycle in a look-like motorcycle. So you see, there is this four-stroke engine, 48 cc, one and a half horsepower. Ducati starts building motorcycles in 1946. Honda starts the next year. By 1963, Suzuki, Yamaha, and Kawasaki are all in the motorcycle business. After World War II, uh, people need cheap transportation. And as, as anything, if two guys show up, there's going to be a race. 1954 was the year in which uh, Fabio Taglioni was hired by Ducati. Fabio Taglioni was the engineer that changed Ducati from a common bike to a bike derivated by a racing bike. He needed to develop something by his own, so something new, something that was strictly connected with his uh, will to feel uh, the, the so-called need for speed. Ducati was the first of the five companies to officially start racing, but soon they all did. The era of the modern sport bike was born. Fast forward to the present. A Ducati test rider rips through the countryside near Bologna, Italy. Bologna is where Ducatis are built. First of all, you have to be Bolognese like I am to understand this. It's something special that is made also from the people from Bologna, from this region. The other region in which, in which you can find Ferrari, Lamborghini, Maserati and Ducati. I, I used to say this region has been touched by the hands of God. There is another connection between fast cars and fast bikes. Modern sport bikes are built the same way they build modern sports cars. It's an automotive way of doing stuff. It costs eight modules, which you could pre-assemble on a bench. On the assembly line, you just bolt everything together, which is really automotive. The design of the new bikes makes them easier and quicker to build. Two small onboard computers replace thick, old wiring harnesses. Just one change shaves 10 pounds off the bike and eliminates hours of tedious wiring work. With the help of computer-aided design, the new Ducati 999 is built with 23% fewer parts than the bike it replaced. The build process begins with the engine. Major parts are provided by outside suppliers and at the factory, the focus is on final machining and assembly. Frames arrive at the factory already painted. Metal sculptures waiting to come alive. They call these things pick carts. A computer makes sure each cart has the right parts waiting so workers don't have to waste time. The last step on the assembly line is the rolling road test chamber. Computers monitor engine performance as each new bike is fired up for the very first time. Finally, the bikes are lined up to be shipped all over the world where many of them will join other brands of super bikes doing battle on the racetrack. And winning on Sunday still helps sell on Monday. The whole Ducatisti thing, that's born out of winning the races, looking cool, having a great sound. It's actually easy to fall in love with, with beautiful things. We know what our enthusiasts want. They want high performance, um, sport motorcycling, and of course, for our most extreme and demanding enthusiasts, they want the best race bikes they can find. They want replicas of what's racing. It is the most advanced street legal motorcycle you can buy. It is the closest to a race bike you can walk into your dealer and buy. The sport bikes today are, are, are built for performance. They uh, accelerate, they handle the braking power, uh, the speeds that they will, they're capable of are, are just 
phenomenal. You can buy our sport bike right off your showroom floor. I mean, it's total high performance. And we go to the racetrack and show how much performance it actually has. For Kawasaki, the job starts here at its U.S. race team headquarters in Southern California. This is your standard Kawasaki ZX-6. This is the way they come at the dealer. So we receive it here, just like anybody else would. Uh, the boys start to uncrate it, roll it up on the bench, and start preparing it for to get ready to race. We'll remove all the standard bodywork, remove all the lights, we'll remove the standard muffler. We'll actually take it down to the frame, take the motor out, the motor will begin to be pre prepared for racing, and Ross and JJ will begin the slow process, or fast process, depends on your point of view. It takes anywhere from a few days to a few weeks to get the bike from the crate ready for the track. It all depends on how much time the crew has before the next race. It's, it's funny because being in the racing industry, there's such a high competitive level. It's always neat to see who can get done first, and it's usually by maybe a minute or 30 seconds. It's not much, but it's still sort of a competition for us as being a mechanic. The bike is torn down to every last nut and bolt. We're almost down to the bare frame. We're going to drop the motor, take it over to the engine room, and get it ready to race. This is our race engine, 600 cc's. It's about a quarter of the size of an average car engine. Take everything apart, look over everything, measure everything, go through the, the cylinder head, completely redo the valve job, because you want to make sure that the cylinder head seat is really, really clean. You know, so that every time the thing closes, there's nothing getting by, no fuel getting by or any of that stuff. So it's a nice, clean burn. There's a trade-off when they tune the engines to go racing. The racing engines won't last as long as motors and normal street bikes, but they make a lot more power. The extra wear and tear doesn't matter because the engines are torn down and completely rebuilt after every race. Tolerances are quite a bit different than a standard motorbike. A uh, standard motorcycle is... Uh, a lot tighter tolerances than we tend to run. Uh, we run them a little bit looser, create a little less friction. It's one of the beauties that we have is we're able to test constantly if we have to. Is because you have to keep up with the next guy. You know, you have to be able to go to that next next weekend knowing that you're gonna be up on the competition one way or another. We've brought in the engine from the engine room after it being rebuilt. Uh, it's now on our test bench. We break it in for an hour, we let it cool down for an hour, and then we make three or four, say five, power runs on it. A power run means taking each new engine up to full power to see how much horsepower it has and to make sure nothing is going to break. The screen you're looking at compares the horsepower between a standard engine, as we received it, and our current race engine, as you can see, it represents about a 15 to 20 percent increase, uh, the red one being the standard engine and the black one being the modified engine. Revved to the max, the race engine produces more than 120 horsepower. That's about the same horsepower as many cars, except that car engines are a lot bigger. The efficiency of the motor is way higher than, than it would be in a, a car. And that's because not every part on a sport bike is what it looks like. The gas tank, for example, also plays a part in creating more power. Typically you look at a bike and you see this area up here and you assume that the whole thing's a gas tank. And when you lift up the tank, you actually see that the back portion's the gas tank. The front portion was hollow. The two main reasons for uh, the design changes was to increase the flow of the air into the engine as well as to lower the center of gravity by moving the gas tank back and down a little further. This is something you cannot do with a regular motorcycle. Shifting through the gears without ever touching the clutch or getting off the gas. The uh, 
Quick shifter, basically what that allows the rider to do is uh, shift without uh, closing the throttle and without engaging the clutch. In your car, if you were to try to shift without using the clutch, you'd probably never even get it out of the gear that you were trying to leave into the next gear. Here we can go through from first to sixth basically as quick as you can think it. One, two, three, four, five, and you're in sixth gear. The quick shifter is a high-tech electronic sensor that kills power to the engine when the rider's foot presses the shift pedal. It happens in less time than it takes to blink your eye, but on a racetrack, every fraction of a second counts. If you shift 15 times around a racetrack for 20 laps, that adds up to tenths of a second, and that's the difference between winning and losing a lot of times. In the race preparation stage of the bike, we go to an aftermarket lever, which better suits the riders. It's shorter, it has a deeper arc in it. Uh, this allows them to get their two fingers up on the brake lever without pulling the end of the brake lever back into their knuckles on the far two fingers. When the build is finished, the next step is to make sure everything is lined up exactly where it should be. In the old days, they eyeballed it. Now it's a computer controlling a coordinate measuring machine. The beauty of this machine is we can measure from the steering axis, for example, to the swing arm pivot because we can't physically measure it. We can't physically put a ruler through the gas tank, through the engine. This enables us to measure that distance with pinpoint accuracy. Is this is actually really cool. We take coordinates th throughout the bike and then we basically connect the dots to make a motorcycle on the screen. But we can rotate it around, look at everything, check everything, make sure things are straight. It really helps with the understanding, especially for us when we're at the racetrack and you know, a rider comes in, like you got 10 minutes to fix this problem. When you can see it in your mind, what you need to do to fix the problem. It sure makes it easier to make those split-second decisions. The measuring machine is accurate down to a single millimeter or four one-hundredths of an inch. And to the men who race these bikes, every millimeter matters. This machine allows us to custom tailor the motorcycle to every rider. No different than going to a tailor and custom making a suit. When they're sure the suit fits perfectly, there's still one final test. This is the last step. Now we're going to put it on the chassis dyno for our final quality check. Finally, when everything has been checked and double checked, it's time to load up all the bikes and gear and head 3,000 miles cross country. Destination, the Road Atlanta Race Circuit in Georgia. It normally takes us about uh, half an hour to load the truck and there's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. Two bikes for each rider, extra engines, body panels, and almost every tool from the shop. We have several toolboxes, barbecues, uh, tires, fuel, um, parts, bodywork, I mean, All just sorts of stuff. stuff. Next stop. Road Atlanta, two and a half miles of rolling, twisting asphalt baking under the hot Georgia sun. It'll push both men and machines to the limit. And finding where those limits are is what it's all about when you go racing. It's been five days since the Kawasaki race team loaded up their big rig in California Five days to drive across the heartland of America. Destination, Road Atlanta, one of the most challenging racing circuits in the world. But this is a part of Road Atlanta you never get to see, a private testing session for all the major teams and riders. There are no fans, no spectators, for the next 48 hours Road Atlanta is off limits to the public. If you think about a testing session, road racing testing session, it's really the, the, the it's a laboratory on wheels. 
We're here at Road Atlanta testing to try to make the bike better for the guys. Things like final gear ratios, suspension settings, and so on. Uh, this will help us get a faster lap time, which is really what racing is all about. During actual races, there's no time to experiment, and the rules prevent the use of computers to monitor the bikes. But anything goes during a test session, and that's why test sessions are absolutely critical. We're going to need to go three seconds quicker. That's not going to be on the straightaways. I wish, but no. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so you want to go shorter? I think, because I'd like to only shift once per turn one carry. Okay, well, let's try it. We're going to shift twice and only have to carry the same okay. gear once. And let's go back to this gear here because this gives us more, we're in a more happy place as far as, you know, we can go up or down. There's another thing that's special about test sessions. It's part ritual, part preparation. Riders use quiet moments to drive around the track. It's how they memorize every twist and curve. We're professionals, you know, and just like anybody, you know, in football remembering the playbook, you know, that's like, this is like our playbook here. We tested every track where you put 90 laps in a day and it just becomes, you know, like first nature knowing that things about a track. Between laps, crews are busy making all sorts of changes to the bikes, different suspension settings, different gearing, different brakes. Much of it is trial and error at more than 180 miles an hour. The lap times are very indicative of how the bike is working. You see a good lap time, you know the change that you made is good. You see a bad lap time, change of error wasn't very good. What do you think there, Raji? Did you feel anything? That stuff's a little bit like calmer, you know? Calmer? Yeah. I was wondering if you could feel anything like uh, coming out of the corner or uh, even going in. I can or... feel a little bit like coming out of turn five. It just, you know, it might have made it more settled on the brakes like this. Oh, yeah? Whoa. tested a new set of pads and the new pads had more bikes but as soon as he touched the brake lever the front reacted which he likes it gives the rider a confident feeling not all riders like that but roger likes that you gotta have a lot of confidence in the brake especially in this sport you know you're going from 185 mile an hour corner sometimes to a corner that's 40 and you got to brake the latest you can to try to make it about a feel. Each rider likes a, often likes a different type of tire and they like the, the way it feels, you know, the rear grip, entering a corner or whatever. And it's just like a pair of sneakers, it's very personal to a large degree. All the teams run part of their tests with a very special tire. It's made of a really soft compound for maximum grip. So soft, it would never last during an actual race. They use them to get the fastest possible single lap time, which determines starting positions on race weekend. We make tires called qualifying tires that are good. They deliver maximum grip for one lap. After one lap, we throw them away. They cost the same as a race tire, but they're only meant to deliver maximum grip for one lap. On any type of motorcycle tire, the grip comes from what they call the contact patch. 
Yeah. Compact patch is basically what it is. Is where it's 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 the uh, it's the area of the motorcycle tire that where it meets the road. Motorcycle tires look big, but the contact patch is actually very small, and yet that's all there is connecting the bike to the road. We say a rear a, a rear motorcycle racing tire has a contact patch about the size of your palm, you know, under under load. So uh, in the front, maybe the size of three fingers. That's probably something that most people don't know, just how small the contact patch on a motorcycle really is. You know? That small contact patch provides 100% of all the traction for a motorcycle. At any point in time, the amount of traction being used for accelerating, braking, or turning is constantly changing. The trick is being able to manage that traction and never exceed the 100%. If you do, you crash. We're back in the dirt again to show you a relatively painless example of asking for more traction than is truly available. I'm going to take that rear tire right up to 100% of available traction. You see the bike turn in and drive off the corner pretty well. Second time down there, go to 120, 130% of available traction. You see the bike go sideways. You see problems when you ask for more traction than is truly available. If we're aggressive with the throttle, rough with the throttle, jerky with that throttle, we can blow away that contact patch. Smoothness, smooth on that throttle, smooth everything out, tire stays hooked up, and you'll be faster when you're smoother. You might not believe this, but the fastest guys, the best road racers, are the smoothest. Racers have to get to the edge of traction where they get beaten, and it's the riders that can stay just below that edge of traction, not overwhelm this tire, that uh, have repeatable fast results. Next, a racing riddle. How can one wheel be going faster than the other wheel at the same time, and why does that actually slow you down? To win means finding the answer. One of the keys for testing at Road Atlanta is data acquisition, wiring each bike with dozens of tiny computer sensors that measure and record just about everything the bike and rider do. It's kind of like a second opinion for me. You, you know, you feel certain things out there and you come in and when you can see it on the data, uh, it just helps kind of back up, back up what you're thinking and helps you move forward. And... The sensors measure throttle position, engine RPM, and different pressures and temperatures inside the motor. They also record how the suspension is moving and the position of the wheels in relation to the chassis. It's an incredible amount of information that helps both riders and crews fine tune their bikes. I'll just try this right quick and then that'll give us a, I'm anxious to see too, we might see some stuff on the data that maybe even you can't feel, you know what I mean? Maybe some different movement or something. Inside the Kawasaki Big Rig, they're monitoring the data acquisition on laptops. We've just been uh, trying to keep an eye on um, on little things that uh, that would help uh, Tommy and Roger go a little bit faster than they are. Um, just comparing here, we have a comparison of laps that uh, that uh, Tommy and Roger did. Uh, Tommy did a 26.8, and Roger's at a 27.1. There's so much computer data recorded during the test that the final analysis has to wait until the team is back in California. This is data from a Road Atlanta test. So here we have uh, two different color lines, the blue line representing the rear wheel speed, the red line representing the front wheel speed. And as you can see, there's a few areas that there's a big difference in the front wheel speed compared to the rear wheel speed. And this would indicate that the motorcycle is doing a wheelie and the front wheel is actually slowing down somewhat. Both wheels at the same speed means maximum contact with the ground. That translates to maximum traction and maximum performance from the bike. As we can see here, this the bike is accelerating from 50 miles an hour to 130 miles an hour in just under a quarter mile and in less than five seconds. Mm -hmm. 
this is an 80 mile an hour increase in, in under four seconds, and, and a car, any car, would have a hard time doing it in triple or quadruple the time. I mean, it's incredible, really, to think about that. It is truly incredible, both the men and the machines. Now, you can't call these guys fearless, and you can't call them crazy, and, and when I hear somebody say to me, hey, you road race, you must be crazy, they're 100% wrong. These guys, the top guys, are completely focused. They're completely driven to win. They can't lose. I mean, they, they'd race you from here to the garage door to get there first. You can almost feel that focus and drive to win. Back at Road Atlanta, where three weeks after the private testing, the gates are open to the public for the final race weekend of the year. For Matt Aladdin, it's an unprecedented sixth superbike racing crowd. It's been an awesome accomplishment so far, six championships, but in that we're looking forward to coming back next year as well. In the super sport class, Tommy Hayden rides a smooth and calculating race. He cruises to a fifth place finish, earning enough points to win the championship for the entire season. His second consecutive super sport crown. Man, what a race. Tommy clinching the championship, getting the number one plate for the year. Tommy riding as solid as he did. I mean, he had everything under control. My hat's off to my team. My guys, uh, I mean, my team is unbelievable. That bike, obviously, by far the class of the field. I mean, had such, such a good time riding that bike all year and turned out on top again, and, and that's the main thing. Roger wins the super sport race at Road Atlanta with a five second margin at the flag. Outstanding race today. We clinched the championship and Raji won the race. Kawasaki won the race and Kawasaki won the championship. I don't see how you can beat that. Being on the same team with my brother for me is, uh, it's a big help. You always want somebody to ask advice to and who else better to get it from than your brother. We always want to win. You know, today we won twice. You know, we won the championship, which is the big event, and then we won the race. When you watch Roger Hayden get around Road Atlanta, and you think, oh, he's a road racer, I'm a street rider, understand that he's using the exact same principles that a street rider uses. The riders that, that ride motorcycles well on the street or on the racetrack are very serious about it. They're totally committed to understanding how tires work and the chassis works. They understand the edge of performance. So whether you race or just ride for fun, it all comes down to the same thing. Understanding how motorcycles really work and enjoying the thrill of speed on two wheels. People come in, they're dangerous. I go, yes, they are. And you, and that's part of the fun is that you are, you can, you are thrilling yourself that way. It's, and the art of riding, riding motorcycles is getting that thrill without hurting yourself. Uh, motorcycles in the last 20 years have, have improved in leaps and bounds, especially sport bikes. It's, it's been incredible. And in the next 20 years, it's, uh, it's gonna be unimaginable.